time. Well, you're at home with Jim and, Jim and Joy, and I pray you have a blessed new year. Amen. You are an important part of our EWTN family, and we want to wish you a very, very happy new year. Now we have a very special show for you. Today, we take a look back at some of our favorite shows from the past year, because the calendar is telling us to go forward, right? And we want to go forward, but we want to take a look back, just like we talked about in our other show, right? right? Yeah, about our own lives. Mm -hmm. Reflecting on our own lives, lessons learned, and looking towards the future, and we do that with our shows. It's also uh, Mary, Mother of God. It's a solemnity, holy day of obligation. So if you didn't make Mass, had a vigil Mass last night, you have time today, if at all possible, you're healthy enough to do so. We kick off the day with honoring Mary as the Mother of God. Uh, her life, and not only her life, but that she's the Mother of God, tells us that Jesus is divine. Yes. Joy, shows like these where we reflect on At Home with Jim and Joy and the various people we've spoken with really always creates in us such a blessing yes. for the network. Yes. Thank you for your support. Walk with us into the new year. It's more important than ever that we partner together and bring the gospel of Jesus Christ and the good news of the church to the entire world. And Joy, as we do our show, At Home with Jim and Joy, we're so humble we because of the humble. people we get to meet. Yes. And so that's what we're going to be doing uh, for this show. We'll share with you more about the special guests that we're focused upon, some of whom that we spoke with. All of our guests have been absolutely super. Uh, but we want to look at some clips from these special guests and take away from it, as we do with every show, it's like God's discipling us. Yes. God's giving us witnesses, faithful witnesses at this time in the juncture of history. So thanks for joining us today on this new year, Feast of Mary, the Mother of God. We believe that the best is yet to come. We'll be right back. Please don't go away. taking a look at some of our favorite shows from 2019. So we pray that you have a blessed and happy new year. As we look back, our theme, we chose these themes of two of our guests who were on our show in the year 2019. They were heroic witnesses. And one was the beautiful bride, Kristen Hansen. And the other was Guy Gruders, who was the prisoner of war. And both of these people, uh, showed us how to live and love during suffering, how not to give up hope, and how to constantly say yes to the will of God as they move forward in their lives. And so their stories are very heroic, and one is a very young, beautiful bride. The other one is an older gentleman when he was a prisoner of war. So that you and I would get a glimpse of how we're supposed to behave, how we're supposed to respond. What does it mean to be a Christian? How are we supposed to love? How are we supposed to live and do this differently? So let's reflect again by watching Kristen Hansen and Guy Gruders. I am community relations advocate with the Patients' Rights Action Fund and I work nationally to oppose the legalization of assisted suicide. And really that journey began five years ago when my husband was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. And one of the last things he asked of me before he passed, almost two years ago now, was that I continue sharing our story. Right. And that's, that's why I'm here. My husband, JJ, you mentioned, he was a Marine Corps War veteran, a volunteer fireman. He worked in public administration for two New York governors. Wow. And at 33 years old, out of nowhere, he unexpectedly had a grand mal seizure. We were living the American dream. We had our son who was one at the time, and I remember it was a day that had started out like any other, and mm -hmm. then I received a phone call, and it was JJ's number, but when I answered the phone, it was a woman. It was the EMT who was with him. He 
she said that I needed to get to the hospital as fast as I could. And when I got there, they said that everything looked fine. His CAT scan, his tests, they were going to send him home. They didn't know why he had the seizure, but something told me they were missing mm -hmm. something. And I pushed for an MRI, and the MRI showed that he had two lesions. And they did a biopsy, and we found out that he had the most aggressive brain cancer there is, glioblastoma multiform. It can double in size every two weeks. Mm. We were told that it was inoperable because it was located right on his speech center. Mm. And they said the risk was too high that he would lose all ability to speak and understand language if they operated. They said he likely only had four months to live. So at that point, JJ looked at me and he said, I, we need to share our story. We need to give other patients hope because we knew in the beginning mm -hmm. how desperately we needed hope and we wanted to help other people mm -hmm. have hope. And so JJ, not being one to sit on the sidelines, started reaching out to find out how he could share his story. And that was when we became connected with the Patients' Rights Action okay. Fund. And they came to our home and they filmed a video of us, mm -hmm. JJ sharing his story. And that was when we first became involved in the issue. JJ ended up going into remission, yeah. and when he was off all treatment, they came back and asked him if he would become the president of the Patients' <laughs> Rights Action. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I did read it like I couldn't believe it. But That's wow. an amazing story. That's amazing. And it gave so much meaning and purpose to the, the struggle that we had been going through, and, and JJ just, it, his story was perfectly illustrated the dangers of assisted suicide. And so that's what he did in his final days. He dedicated mm -hmm. his final days, his last few years, to tra traveling nationally to mm -hmm. share his story mm -hmm. and making patients and the medical community aware and our legislators aware of mm -hmm. why this is such a dangerous public policy. I think that if I could send any message to, to viewers watching today, JJ and I believe that if we could give even just one person hope, then it would make our journey worthwhile. And having traveled this, this journey with JJ from the beginning until his final breath, I, I would just encourage anyone who's struggling right now with a terminal illness or whatever it is that you're going through to hold on to hope. And even if that hope is just the hope to be able to get through that day. Mm -hmm. right. But especially for patients who are struggling to hold on to hope when they receive that grim prognosis, I encourage you to be an advocate. Mm -hmm. And if it's your loved one, advocate for them. Question, get second and third opinions because I have seen time and time again what difference that makes in a patient's treatment outcome. Yeah. We were kept solo and we were under constant interrogation and torture for military information and to meet delegations that were friendly to them from Europe and the United States. Mm -hmm. This made every day terror. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd wake up in the morning, I was on a boxing team and judo team. Right. Before you go in the ring, and I played football, mm -hmm. before you go into the fight, you have fear in your stomach, mm -hmm. okay? You don't ever show it, but yeah. there's fear in your right. stomach. It's common, all right? It was that kind of thing much worse because the second you woke up in the morning, mm -hmm. you were in a fight to avoid being a traitor. Mm -hmm. This was a fight to avoid being a traitor yes. to the United yes. States. Okay, mm. so it was absolute terror every day. Like I used to tell people, every day was a month, <coughs> every month was a year, every mm. year was a lifetime. Yes. That's how slow the time went. Mm. Well, the hate built up through the months to the mm -hmm. point where I started having voices talking to me mm -hmm. that the way to beat these guys was to commit suicide, mm -hmm. okay? The devil's very smart. Yes. He knew I didn't want to be a traitor, so mm -hmm. he says the way you can really beat them is commit suicide, so just stop eating and so on. So these voices are telling me this kind of things in all kinds of different ways, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, why are these voices talking to me? I'm saying, why does this, why, why is, this is crazy. These things are, these are not my voices. Right. These are other voices, okay? Mm -hmm. Why am I, why is that happening to me? That mm -hmm. means it's a bad guy. Yeah. Why is he talking to me? I'm trying to fight like a son of a gun, mm -hmm. doing the best I can. And then, then again, because my mother and aunt were going to daily mass and communion, mm -hmm. I had the grace to be unblinded. Yes. I said, oh my gosh, it's hate. You know, Satan is hate, God is love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I realized I'm in hate. So I said, I said, and then I remember thinking, well, Lord, you don't mean that I have to forgive these people. 
that's impossible. That's mm -hmm. what I thought in my mind. Sure. And there was dead silence in my mind. I realized, oh my gosh, I got to <laughs> forgive them. So I knew that to go back to Sandy and the kids, you know, to give them a chance, it wouldn't be fair to leave her. Mm -hmm. So I said, it, the, the, with suicide, I said, so I said to go back to her, I got to stop this hate. Okay, I'm going to stop this hate. I'm strong. I'm 25, mm -hmm. strong, I smart. will fight hate. Okay? I will fight hate. Okay. <laughs> Couldn't fight hate. Right. Lost. Completely lost. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I got on my knees and I said, Jesus, I need your help. Please help me. Jesus, if you're there, please help me. Please, please help me. So I prayed uh, hours a day. I didn't remember any of the mysteries of the rosary. I remembered that it was 150 Hail Marys with an hour father every <laughs> 10. That's what I did. I prayed that over and over again through the days. And after three months, I was ecstatic because in my mind, I said, Lord, just in my mind, I couldn't say it out loud, mm -hmm. but in my mind I said, Lord, forgive them. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean it. It was a lie. Right. But just the fact I could form That's forgive right. them in my mind, right. I knew there was progress. So after three more months, I'm literally praying for them. I said, I know they're your kids, Lord. I know you want every one of them in heaven. I'm <laughs> praying for every one of them to go to heaven. Okay. Yeah. And I mean it, and he knew I meant it, and mm -hmm. I had the greatest joy and peace in my heart for those mm -hmm. last three and a half years in prison camp mm -hmm. that I've ever had in my life because I was constantly praying for my enemies. Yes. Honest. And as a result of that, I lived. That's if I hadn't, I wouldn't have lived. Right. What incredible witnesses. Not only were they not overcome by the adversity they faced, but Kristen Hansen went on to take up her husband's call yes. to be a witness for life. And Guy Gruders, American hero, facing incredible adversity and learned the way of overcoming hatred through prayer, through forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Plenty more to come. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Welcome back. Another important theme, some great shows, embracing every life. That's our message as Catholics. Standing opposed to youth in Asia, assisted suicide, Kevin Dunn, great filmmaker, exposes the underbelly of euthanasia and suicide. It's filled with flaws, fatal flaws. We must not buy into this lie. And Tammy Bond deals with suicide. In our own country, it's the second leading cause of death, people taking their own lives. And among youth, it's the first or the second cause of death is suicide. Let's revisit again with Kevin Dunn, Tammy Bond, and hear their evaluations and their solutions for these evils. Take a look. It's a little known fact that there are, there are no laws in Canada about abortion. Mm -hmm. People would believe that there is a law about abortion, but it was actually struck down and there is no law. Mm -hmm. And so, so we've got people running around saying, well, it's my, it's my right, it's this, it's that. Well, there's no right, there's no charter right, and, and there's no constitutional right. Uh, but there is a very powerful force in the culture of death that says it is a woman's, it, it, it is a woman's right to choose whatever language we want to put on this. It is truly about abandonment of the culture. It's truly about abandoning these women in their time of need. It's truly about abandoning these children when we should be stewards of hope. As for the euthanasia law, which was enacted in 2016, uh, called the um, um, uh, medical aid in dying, now made as they call it, again, hmm. kind of a mm. nice term to put yeah. on it. Um, people say, well, it's only gonna be used in these few, few, few instances. It won't change, da, 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 all of these languages all of this language in the law, and we read the law and we went, we read the legislation and went, how ambiguous can it be uh, if your death is reasonably foreseeable? What does that mean? Things like that, which just said, oh my gosh, this, yeah. is, not, this is not just gonna affect very few, which is a tragedy on its own. Right. It's gonna affect the whole culture. And what we've seen in Canada is a constant chipping away. If it's good for them, why isn't it good for me? people fighting to have this law. Because as soon as you put these things into law and say, okay, anything below this level is you're allowed to ask your doctor. Yeah. Uh, well, people come along and they say, well, what about me? And what about me? And all mm -hmm. of a sudden this law keeps getting pushed and pushed. Mm -hmm. And 
what's even worse is the fact that any people below that level now feel their life is not worth living. A life unworthy of living. And where have we heard that before? Mm -hmm. so, so we've got this situation in Canada where doctors, uh, nurses, people in the medical profession, and ourselves are now feeling vulnerable right. to this law. Right. And, it, and it's getting worse. Cardinal Collins in Toronto, Cardinal uh, Thomas Collins, he's been on the forefront of, of, of fighting these laws. And he says, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not about what we can do, he says. It's about who we are as sons and daughters of God. That is what we have to focus on. No matter our state, no matter our condition, whether we're able-bodied walking around or whether in a wheelchair or whether we're in a hospital bed, there is intrinsic value. We have an intrinsic value to those around us and to ourselves as sons and daughters. When we finished the film, um, when we finished the film and all the screenings of Fatal Flaws and Youth and Age of Deception, the number one question people ask is, what can well, I, I do? do? What right. can I do tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And I say, there's two things. Obviously, we have to deal with these laws. We have to inform our, our members of parliament. We have to inform our, our senators, our state representatives. We have to get them informed, put the film in front of them, say, at least watch mm -hmm. this other side. But then there's that thing, what can I do tomorrow? What can I do today? And, and the today is becoming the Samaritan. The today is befriending that person in the going and playing Scrabble. My daughter tells the story of going to play Scrabble with this woman mm. uh, for, for over a year. And, and the woman actually asked her about assisted suicide and said, uh, you know, this is something that I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm considering. It. And she said, wait a minute, I'm part of your family. Mm -hmm. I can be there for, I, I love you. She, you, you, you really love me? She said, yes, I do. I enjoy this time together. She said, well, I guess I won't be thinking about that anymore. So this, yeah. right. there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a change when people feel loved, mm -hmm. and that's the call, to be the Samaritan. We all know that the adolescent brain is not developed, right? I mean, Card but don't tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't tell my 14-year-old that. Um, but, okay, so their brain does not have abstract reasoning. And I think that's why as parents, when we're working with our teenagers, they'll have these flashes of abstract reasoning and you're like, oh, they're getting it! Mm -hmm. And they're not, mm -hmm. right? And 10 seconds later, they're very back to concrete reasoning and they're unreasonable. And um, so you, you take this adolescent brain and it's immature. And now with social media, in a phone in their hand way too much, they are exposed to their peers who also have immature brain chemistry. And it's feeding the system. And the, I, I'm, I like the notion of attachment theory as a therapist, and it's, it's healthy attachments that make us healthy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know this as grandparents and mm -hmm. as parents yourself. And what we're seeing in adolescence, a lot of parents kind of cast to the side, well, at least they're involved socially. Oh, I'm so glad they're on that team. Or mm -hmm. they're, you know, oh, they went out on this date. They went out on that date. Oh, they're out with their group of buddies again. And <clears throat> what, what a lot of physicians now and psychiatrists are studying in terms of neurology, because we can see it in the brain now, we can see it through PET scans and CAT scans, they need to be with us. Yes. Because we have the mature brain. We have abstract reasoning. We have understanding and can reason out. They can't. And we're anointed by God to have that place. Right. There. And we want God's best for them, yes. where maybe their friends don't. Right. right. By virtue of adolescence, the attachments and friendships in adolescence are insecure. Mm -hmm. There is not security there. Mm -hmm. I, I see this all the time. Mm -hmm. Some kid will come in my office, sit down, so and so is my best friend. And the next week they're in my office again and <laughs> they're not their best friend, they're their enemy and maybe they don't even mention them. Right. So there's this kind of like, they're a very insecure attachment and that does something to the soul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there's a great book called um, uh, Keep Your Kids Near, Keep mm -hmm. Your Kids Close, I mm -hmm. believe it's called. And I love what the two doctors in the book assert. They're, they're saying, look, transfer the time. If your child is spending 80% of their time with their peers through social media, school, all the things, switch it. It should be 80% you, 20% peers. Mm -hmm. wow. Because of this attachment stuff, we, yeah. we are secure attachments. Our love is unconditional. And we see high, high suicide rates, and as you do, uh, post-abortion post syndrome, uh, suicide through hopelessness, bullying, mm -hmm. um, postpartum depression. So w it's coming in all, all veins of life. And um, there's so many great treatment options. Mm -hmm. I was listening to a TED Talk recently by a guy that is the officer for the Golden Gate Bridge. 
when people are, we're going to take their life on the mm -hmm. Golden Great Bridge. Great talk. And he was saying that out of the hundreds, makes me want to cry, out of the hundreds and hundreds of people he's talked to, only two have taken their life. Mm. Because all you got to do is listen. listen. Mm. You just need to get them talking and mm -hmm. listening. It mm -hmm. works. Yes. I know this for a fact as a therapist sitting in the office with folks or just intervening in a crisis situation. You listen, you get them talking, and that human connection yeah. has a spirit to it, has, has a unity to it that pulls them out a little bit. Well, thank you so much for Kevin Dunn and Tammy Bond and the great work that they're doing in defending the culture of life. And together here with your EWTN family, we will build a culture of life. Thank you so much for joining us. God bless you and have a happy new year.